All right. So as expected, the big announcement has come in. The Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi will visit China for what's being described as an informal summit with the Chinese President Xi Jinping. The dates have been announced by both the foreign ministers of India and China. That visit is going to take place on the 27th and 28th of April. Just going to take you through some of the major details of what was discussed regarding that possible meeting. Um, Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, is saying that President Xi and Prime Minister Narendra Modi will have an informal bilateral. The communication will be of strategic nature and, ex and an exchange of view on overarching and long-term strategic matters on future ties as well will come up for discussion. As mentioned earlier, this meeting is going to take place from the 27th to the 28th of April in the Chinese city of Wuhan. What's very interesting to note here, this is not related to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. That's a separate meeting altogether. This one taking place as early as the last few days of April, uh, just a couple of days, in fact, from today, five days from now is when that visit in Wuhan is going to take place. Interestingly, Wang Yi also mentioning the fact that high-level discussions have been on for months now between concerned individuals on either side to make sure that this informal summit goes through. So once again, indicating that both sides seem to be keen on resetting the ties uh, following what happened last year with the Doklam standoff, with, of course, skirmishes uh, with reference to the uh, Mansarovar uh, visits as well. So that also coming up. I'll take you through that in just a second. But also a mention of... Uh, what else was discussed by the Indian foreign minister and the Chinese foreign minister today said that uh, in the bilateral meeting between Ms. Swaraj and uh, Mr. Wang, an in-depth exchange of views took place. There was a broad-based consensus that was reached on high-level engagement and cooperation between India and China. Now, uh, I'm quoting or paraphrasing, I should say, Wang Yi here when he says that uh, in our view in times to come, the two sides will focus on implementing the outcomes reached at the informal summit between Prime Minister Modi and President Xi, a deepening of practical cooperation and enhancing of people-to-people -people ties and the proper handling of differences. This is an interesting point given what happened with Doklam and of course uh, there was also a reference made to the coordination of a resolution of these differences and of course a mention of opportunities for even better and faster growth of ties from a quote-unquote new starting point. Let me go across to Vion Sidhan Sibbal. He's joining us on the broadcast for more on that story. Sidhan, uh, before we go any further. The fact that this meeting is taking place between President Xi and Prime Minister Modi can't indicate anything other than the fact that that reset button has been hit. Well, rightly said, uh, this is a, a major step in India-China relationship and if you look at historical par parallels, it, we can compare it with uh, Rajiv Gandhi's visit uh, to China in 1988 that, uh, uh, that transformed India-China relationship. But uh, talking about the press conference which happened by the Indian Foreign Minister and the Chinese Foreign Minister, it talked about various issues, issues like terror, issues like climate change, how both the countries can re-engage, especially after Doklam. This visit will be the fourth visit by the Indian Prime Minister to China. He first went for a bilateral visit in 2015. He went for G20 summit. He went for BRICS summit and finally is going for this summit. And remember the use of terminology informal summit. They haven't called it a formal summit. We actually don't know the difference also much. But it's an informal summit which is going to take place in the Chinese city of Wuhan. Uh, that's uh, one of the most populated cities in central China. And it's also called uh, the Chicago of China. So uh, uh, there is a message, of course. Uh, but uh, this uh, visit uh, is also f for resetting the button and, of course, re-engaging um, themselves. Uh, we have seen a number of high-level um, uh, visits happening between India and China. The Chinese trade minister was in India. He met the commerce minister, Suresh Prabhu and discussed about a lot of issues, including the issue of trade deficit. That was something that is a concern for India. Then, of course, the big visit happened between the uh, Indian NSA. He went to Shanghai. He met his counterpart in uh, uh, Shanghai. And, of course, uh, uh, right. uh, that was another big visit. And after that, we are seeing uh, two important visits. The visit by our foreign minister and our defense minister. The defense minister will leave tomorrow uh, for China. And uh, both will be participating in the respective SCO meet, the SCO uh, foreign minister's meet and the SCO 
your defense ministers meet. Right. Stay with me, Siddhant. Uh, Aina Tangan, uh, an expert on India-China ties and, of course, on China itself, joining us on the broadcast as well. Aina, good evening. You know, we, we've spoken in the past about, uh, you know, the, uh, let's say, uh, downturn when it comes to the ties between India and China. But this is definitely an upswing. The fact that uh, the two men, President Xi and Prime Minister Modi, are engaging in this informal summit as early as next week. All right, we've uh, lost our connection with uh, Aina. We'll get in touch with him in just a bit. But also with me on the broadcast is uh, Professor Swaran Singh of the prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, Professor Swaran Singh, thank you for joining us here on Weon. First off, if I could ask you for your reaction to this uh, meeting that's been announced. It's finally uh, out there in the public domain. There is going to be a meeting between President Xi and Prime Minister Modi. I think as you described, uh, it seems there is an upswing in the visits. If you notice this month particularly, there are so many visits that have taken place, uh, especially from India to China. So upswing, I think, is a right uh, expression at this stage. The visit of Prime Minister was originally uh, slated, as we were hearing, to middle of next month. So this is advanced to as early as next week now. Yes, I can tell you. All right, if I can also ask you, uh, Professor Singh, uh, you know, th there was a reference that was made by uh, the Foreign Minister Wang Yi when he was talking about this informal summit. Uh, the, the stress, of course, on the word informal, also calling it uh, the a new starting point. Why do you think that is important for us to look at? I think it's important to understand why this is called informal summit. Because in terms of their exchange of state visits, uh, President Xi Jinping came to India in September of 2014, followed by Indian Prime Minister's visit to China in May of 2015. Bilateral visits have not happened since then. So by protocol, it would mean Xi Jinping's visit to New Delhi is due now. So because Indian Prime Minister is traveling to China, it is being described as an informal visit. Second, very closely, the implication may be that it is primarily emphasizing on their personal bon homie or personal chemistry, at least, which has been visible whenever they have been meeting. And we remember their three meetings during the Doklam crisis. So informality could also be focusing on the personal initiatives that the two might take. But the overall mood, as you saw in the press conference, seems very encouraging. Several uh, things have been clinched in that sense. The whole uh, revival of exchange of hydrological data is now promised for Satlej and Brahmaputra. Also, the pilgrimage from Nathula is being revived. So these are issues that are already settled as if to be revived between China and India. That sets the stage really very positive for the summit meeting to take place. Uh, of course, it raises expectations. It surges the, the kind of blood on both sides as to what can be clinched. Right. There are issues on the table. I think CPEC and now increasingly being talked about Nepal, India, China, cultural corridor. These are issues that perhaps will be important issues other than the ongoing issues of India's membership. Absolutely. To NSC. So the sticking points, of course, uh, are many. There is, of course, Masood Azhar, China's, uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. We'll get to each of those in just a bit. Uh, also with me on the broadcast is Vion's associate editor, Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Aina Taghed is back with us on the show as well. Uh, Aina, to you first. Uh, before we get into the nitty-gritties of what was discussed uh, by both uh, foreign ministers, if I can ask you for your overall uh, opinion on the announcement that's been made as far as this meeting, this informal summit between uh, President Xi and Prime Minister Modi goes? Well, <clears throat> although they're calling it informal, I think it's, uh, if you start looking at the context of this, I mean, if you go back uh, to what's happening in terms of trade, where India is, obviously India has a, a security arrangement with the U.S., but it seems in recent events with uh, that it's looking for an enhanced trade a relationship with China, which would be a very good balance for India's security and also its economic future. I think what we've seen here is a clearing of the table. All past business has been taken care of. I agree that there's going to be a lot of action, uh, potentially, 
on issues that are dear to China in terms of Taiwan and the Belt and Road Initiative, and also to India in terms of the uh, nuclear suppliers group uh, membership, uh, the India-Pakistan corridor, uh, and also this issue about uh, China's uh, unwillingness to uh, take away protections for individuals named by uh, India as terrorists at the UN. Right. Uh, Palki, uh, when, when we're looking at uh, what all has happened in the last year, uh, specifically with uh, the Doklam standoff, the fact that these high-level meetings have been taking place, the fact that a reference to a months of high-level engagement was made by Wang Yi for this informal summit to go through, it just goes to show that both sides seem equally committed, it seems, to resetting and uh, putting the past behind them and moving forward on a, a new note, if you will. Absolutely. Uh, the 73-day-long Doklam standoff was uh, a, a low, a, a, a very serious low in the India-China relationship, but it also gave both the sides a very clear message that a military conflict, a confrontation is not the solution. It is not going to uh, benefit either side. And so uh, this concerted effort has been made from both sides uh, to, to make sure that, that they can sit at the talking table and try to, as, as the Chinese foreign minister said, quote unquote, handle differences. There are very many differences, a lot of bugbears. And uh, this informal meeting, while very, very significant, uh, is not going to probably resolve most of these. Uh, the, the most the, the the longest outstanding issue has been border border resolution is not expected the NSG entry uh, that the bid that uh, India has been making may not be resolved either Masood Azhar remains an outstanding issue so does the Belt and Road Initiative so there are a lot of problems there are a lot of issues that need to be dealt with and it is going to take time but this is a start and the conciliatory tone is uh, according to me the biggest takeaway from this joint press conference Aisha both sides are making the effort both sides are talking about people to people contact strategic cooperation resuming uh, data sharing on Brahmaputra and the Satluj River, talking about reopening Natula for the Kailash Mansar over Yatra. These are beginnings. These are first steps towards a, a more comprehensive cooperation, if you may. Uh, but this certainly is a start. And they're talking about these two leaders uh, uh, trying to uh, trying to look at common interests, which according to both sides outweigh differences. So this is a beginning. And of course, we'll have to see where they take it. Absolutely. Uh, Professor Singh, uh, going off of what uh, Palki just mentioned, uh, the outstanding issues, of course, are immense. But the fact of the matter is, these are baby steps that seem to be ta being taken in the right direction. And uh, the tone, as Palki pointed out, conciliatory, definitely, especially when compared to the sort of saber rattling we'd seen last year uh, from either side when it came to Doklam? I think both sides uh, have reasons to uh, show this conciliatory tone. Uh, uh, this week only in Beijing, the ambassadors of European Union have issued a report about their view on BRI. And it has been fairly critical of the unfair practices of BRI. Only one country of the entire European Union, Hungary, that ambassador did not sign it. So Chinese are also realizing the commercial viability issues, the political legitimacy issues. And on the other side, India also realizes that more and more nations, especially friends of India, Russia, Nepal, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, are getting interested in China-Pakistan economic corridor. Nepal is already signing up and working together on BRI. So both sides are realizing that there are compulsions and limitations that they have, and they cannot really go on brandishing kind of independent streaks of their own. They both have to work together to resolve differences. So I think some of these issues are very dear to Chinese, and I think they will be looking at the submit as to what can they get from India in terms of coming on board. As of now, they have not announced 2018 submit meeting for BRI, if you, if you, if you remember. Last year, India had absented from that. So Chinese have their reasons, and I suppose India has our own reasons as to why we agreed to advancing it so early to five days from now. So I think there are both uh, uh, acting a bit maturely and pragmatically as to how to deal with each other. And it will definitely raise expectations on both sides, even if it is a very, very short notice summit meeting in Wuhan. Uh, I think it shows that both leaders are in command and are willing to take risks. And uh, let's see what happens at summit. And I think at least some initiatives, the mood at least is very positive, uh, but uh, expectations will also go up likewise.
Absolutely. And, and as much as we'd like to wait, we are in the media business, so we have to talk about what might happen. So let me go across to Aina Tangen on that note. Aina, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the other thing that kept coming up was uh, this reference to profound global changes and the fact uh, of India and China's, uh, you know, uh, brotherhood, uh, its shared cultural past. Why do you think that the two of those uh, references were made in perhaps the same sentence over and over again? Well, I, I think there's a growing realization that the world trade um, status quo has been changed irrevocably by Donald Trump's actions, his desire to be uh, less, uh, more uh, bilateral, le less unilateral, his trade wars, uh, his constant pressure, even on uh, India in terms of accusing it of the currency manipulation um, and not uh, being fair to quote American products. I think uh, Donald Trump was quoted mocking uh, Narana Modi for um, offering a, a goodwill gesture over the phone. I don't think that went over very very well. But let's step back a second and start thinking, <clears throat> what do these two nations have to gain? Things have changed dramatically with 40% of the population with the highest growth rates. Uh, these two nations represent the future in terms of if you have money, these are the places you want to be. And quite frankly, you know, the nations that have the money, you know, EU and US have oh, almost 60% of the world's wealth. But all the wealth in the world is not good unless you can get a return on it. So I think what you're starting to see here is a reversal, something like what happened when OPEC was created in the early 70s, when you have these two nations getting together and saying that we are going to be equal partners at the economic table. We will not be treated as second-class uh, citizens when it comes to net economic issues that if you want to come to our markets, it's going to be a formula, not your right. All right. Siddhant, uh, Siddhant Sibbal, my colleague, also with us on the broadcast. Siddhant, uh, referring now to, uh, you know, the mention of uh, this recognition, perhaps, of the uh, uh, unbridled potential when it comes to economic ties between India and China. But let's not forget, you know, there was a lot of aggressive posturing that took place when it came to Doklam. Uh, and not very long, uh, not too far back ago, you know, we're, we're talking about six months ago when India and China were engaged in the 73-day-long standoff. So a lot definitely has had to have happened behind the scenes for us to reach the sort of placating tones we got to hear today from both foreign ministers. Well, uh, as you said, a uh, lot of potential is between uh, when both these countries uh, come together, India and China, and that was, of course, mentioned during the press conference by both the foreign ministers. And, of course, uh, this paves way for this big informal uh, summit. And as I was telling you before, that this summit, uh, before this summit, there were a lot of high-level engagements, whether it's the NSA, whether it's their trade minister coming to India, um, uh, and now, of course, the foreign minister and, of course, the defense minister going there. And the basic uh, point is that both India and China know that the world is changing. Uh, both of them needs ally, and uh, China and India are two large countries. Uh, particularly, this was mentioned by the Chinese foreign minister. And it's time that both the large countries, both Asian countries, come together and both also refer to the fact that centrality of the United Nations. The WTO, which is coming under a lot of pressure from the United States, and also on the issue of terror. The issue of terror was raised during the last press conference by, uh, that's on uh, Friday, uh, of the spokesperson of China. This question was raised on the issue of terror. The, uh, the Chinese side backed Pakistani side and obviously said that Pakistan is doing a lot on the issue of terror, but that's something that concerns India because Pakistan is not doing uh, the big, th uh, lot, uh, uh, not doing a lot of things on the issue of terror, and India has been raising this issue with China, right. particularly when it comes to Masood Azhar. And of course, the other big thing will be NSG, India's bid for NSG. China is the only country that's blocking it. So these are the two things which will be top of the priority of the Indian Prime Minister. But other than that, it's the CPEC, China Pakistan. Pakistan economic corridor that concerns India because it passes through Indian territory that's illegally occupied by Pakistanis. So that is another issue which will be raised by the uh, Indian Prime Minister. Absolutely. And of course, beyond those specifics, uh, Palki, as you were mentioning, uh, they are, uh, you know, a huge uh, number of outstanding issues between the two countries. These perhaps might not come up in specific when this summit takes place uh, later this week. But when we're looking at this meeting, and, and of course, in India and China, I'm sure there's a lot 
lot of discussion going on on the import of what uh, you know is going to happen uh, on the 27th and 28th of April. But why does this summit also matter for the region at large, for other countries uh, like Nepal, like Sri Lanka, which also have extremely important ties with uh, with China? Yes, and both uh, the countries that you mentioned and some other smaller neighbors, Aisha, have in the past been accused of trying to play their two uh, larger neighbors against each other. They need money. Uh, uh, both Nepal and Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka especially has uh, has been described as a country which is now in the Chinese debt trap. Uh, so there are implications, of course, for the region. Uh, but coming back to what Siddhant was saying, we often say that diplomacy and politics is the art of the possible. So when two sides come together, yes, there are differences and there are cl clear, clear red lines which will not be crossed. For instance, uh, the fact that CPEC is going to go through Gilgit Baltistan is something that India will not relent on. But there are other issues where India might agree to walk halfway. And that is what we're looking at, though that, that meeting point, that ground, uh, because both sides, both leaders who are in very strong positions in domestic politics right now have the ability to bring that uh, uh, that change, that turning point, as I think one of, uh, one of the two foreign ministers said, that this is an important milestone, a crucial point in ties between India and China. Uh, one, uh, bo both, are, both are among the fastest growing economies in the world, and the potential is immense. Uh, as, as Ainar also said, with the trade war, and he said, said that this is a good balancing act for India uh, uh, opening the Indian markets, but it's equally crucial for China, which needs a larger market. Uh, it's all right to have Nepal and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and Pakistan on board, but eventually it is the Indian market of 1.32 billion people. That is the price that China is looking at. And India's uh, boycott of the BRI summit last year is something that Beijing did not take very well. So this is a new start in a way. Uh, is India going to, to come on board? That is, that is going to be the biggest catch for China, the biggest prize for China. Will India join the Belt and Road Initiative? We do not know yet. But the Gilgit-Baltistan point is something that India, I believe, is not going to relent on. So some adjustments will have to be made there if uh, things have to move forward on that front. But there are a lot of other issues. Interestingly, Global Times, which was at the forefront of the rhetoric that we saw during Doklam and all the threats that emanated from China, uh, only recently, I think two days back, came out with a write-up which said that people to people contact will be the key in bolstering ties. And Chinese students should be looking at Indian management institutes uh, to understand the business culture, to understand the uh, the, the, the way things happen in India and take that knowledge back to China or operate for Chinese companies here. So the mood certainly is changing and both sides are looking at ways uh, where, where uh, they can find uh, a common meeting point and take it forward from there. Absolutely. Uh, Professor Swaran Singh and, and you know, uh, without uh, trying to sound like I'm drawing a, you know, an overarching picture, but striking a bargain, I think that comes quite easily to both the Indians and the Chinese. Uh, do you think adaptation and adjustment is really going to be key now uh, between India and China. Recognition of problems, sure, but uh, also uh, looking forward at the future, keeping in mind global shifts, global uh, paradigm changes, that is really going to be the focus when it comes to these two Asian giants. I agree with you. I think they both sides are going to really push hard to achieve their national interests. And I heard Palki saying that uh, obviously maps in case of China-Pakistan economic corridor cannot be changed. But we have another example of BCIM economic corridor, Bangladesh, Myanmar, India, China economic corridor, which also deals with disputed boundaries uh, of China and India. So I think the focus will increasingly be on how to remodel or how to rename that corridor, which could then perhaps address or redress India's serious reservations regarding CPEC. So uh, I assume that something of that nature has been suggested and could be followed on both sides. You also made a very important point as to what it means for smaller neighbors as to how China and India really make up their mind on issues like BRI. Very simple, at least for them, they will not have the difficulty of choosing either side. So if both sides are willing to cooperate and kind of build models where they can partner together, the countries like Nepal or, or Afghanistan or others would perhaps feel easier in, in being part and benefiting from those initiatives. But India is a major player in, in, in that whole exercise, and Chinese increasingly have shown, and the reconciliatory note shows that realization that they see India as their most important and largest neighbor, and probably the powerful economy in neighborhood, which must be on board to make these grand initiatives successful. So I assume they will have to accommodate India's interest, and there is an inclination that one, one can notice that inclination in, in their proposals now, 
So I suppose that kind of strategic thinking, that's how the whole focus is on strategic dialogue at Wuhan, that what can we do together in long term is how the focus is, is, is has to be, because then other officials at various levels can then deal with these issues. And I suppose that is what we are looking at, what is the vision which is long term that both the leaders wish to really communicate. And that is why the whole talk of global you know, landscape, and I understand the whole change of relationship, at, at least in trade between US and, and China. Absolutely. He's again, he's again favoring India. And you will notice Indian exports really going up in coming year as well. So I think India stands to be slightly at advantage how we were last year. But that's not to say that we don't have limitations. Both sides have to be careful with their limitations as well. But upswing, I think, is a correct expression at this stage. Let's see what happens in Wuhan next week. Absolutely. Um, and to broaden the ambit of this conversation a little bit further, Aina, uh, you know, last year when Doklam happened, a number of uh, countries had spoken up about concerns over uh, the standoff between India and China, the United States, the United Kingdom. But now looking at, uh, you know, the extending of this olive branch and the acceptance thereof, uh, do you think this is going to catch global attention as well, especially since China has been at the receiving end of a particular President Trump's uh, wrath of late? Oh, absolutely. It's already uh, raising a lot of concern in Washington, D.C. as we speak. They're trying to figure out exactly what this means. It's come up very quickly in their eyes, and they're, they are concerned. As you know, um, the, the U.S. is counting on India to be kind of a doorstop to uh, Chinese expansion. If for some reason India and China get together, that is going to have serious consequences. But, you know, when we talk about the possibility, um, you know, it was mentioned that that is the essence of diplomacy. Let me just throw something in there. Everyone seems to be talking about the China-Pakistan um, uh, economic corridor. But, you know, there is a rail line that will be going to the India-Nepal border. There is no question about the border there. If that was continued through India to, east, to um, western ports in India, that would, in essence, change the entire landscape because India can offer a safe, um, absolutely uh, good ports, everything that China is looking for as it wants to expand into, uh, get resources from, I should say, both the Middle East and also Africa. It also brings into play another thing. With such a secure crossing, all right, now that brings into play perhaps a China-Russia corridor, which would allow, once again, safe passage for Chinese goods and resources going into China to through Russia, with Russia, and also Europe. So this, with some creative thinking, thinking about the possible, this could be a game changer. Absolutely. Uh, quite a positive spin, uh, Aina Tangen. I'm not used to that from you when it comes to India-China conversations. Palki, from, uh, from com competing to complementing, is that uh, really something that we can talk about at, uh, at uh, this stage, considering how early it is uh, when it comes to the development of this relationship, if at all? Well, it's... Uh, 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 Diplomacy, I, I would say, Aisha, from what I've observed over the years, is about the optics more than anything else. Where in tangible terms, things are delivered uh, over a longer period of time. But once you create the right atmosphere, make the right noises, that's half your work done. And uh, in the India-China context, we've seen this uh, uh, this seesaw uh, more often than uh, than than once. Uh, we've seen the hindi chini bhai bhai phase, and then the war, and so on and so forth. And uh, we quoted uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, from 1982 who told Rajiv Gandhi that if this was to be uh, the 21st century was to be the century of Asia, India and China will have to come together to work towards it. And uh, I, I don't want to be sounding too optimistic, but at the same time, if if this is the beginning, then that is where it may it may finally go. Of course, uh, uh, it it is also very important to note, Aisha, that both the leaders who are who are at the forefront of this initiative are very strong in in their domestic positions and can can thus steer the two countries in a direction of their choosing at this point in time and that uh, plays a no insignificant role when it comes to a game changing decision like this because what we saw last year during the 73 day long standoff of Doklam was the two countries were on the brink of war uh, major powers in the world did not say very much uh, and and there was palpable tension 
we were this close to to engaging in a military conflict so this really is coming a long way and to that extent it's very very significant when they say it's a milestone it certainly is uh, because uh, for the for the two prime ministers to hold an informal meeting before they were supposed to and to chalk out differences we are talking about uh, a, a, a military drill who would have imagined india china and pakistan doing a joint military drill in russia uh, these are two countries that india has fought wars with and now to have a, a, a now to have a military exercise with them uh, is is uh, sounds implausible did sound implausible at one point but certainly isn't it possible because uh, we are going to see that in the days ahead absolutely uh, things that one wouldn't have imagined uh, to have happened 6 months ago seem to be taking place as we speak and uh, professor swaran singh siddhant uh, be patient with me i'll come to you in a second uh, uh, professor singh uh, you know cautious optimism has been a term that's been bandied around quite a bit uh, of late given what's happening between uh, you know north korea uh, south korea and the united states but i guess that is something that can be employed uh when we're talking about india china ties given that it has been a sort of pendulum uh you know sort of uh, relationship in the past so really we can't put everything down in stone right now but cautious optimism would you uh, prescribe to that idea right now i think so that's a, a good expression because <clears throat> both are major economies both are very powerful and ambitious leaders they will try to you know hard negotiate on each of these issues so it's not going to be you know take away from either side it will be really hard bargain but very quick point i think the issue of china nepal india cultural corridor which is now being called economic corridor has not come officially as a proposal so far i think it's only now coming it looks maybe this is easier but we have to be careful india's border with nepal is porous and that could open up you know the whole dumping of chinese products into india so on each of these issues whether it is russia india uh, transport corridor or any of the corridors i think both sides will have to be very careful in negotiating as to where we are going together and i think that will make this cautious optimism as a good expression to say that we should be careful in not being too ambitious but expectations are you know not in control i think media is already abuzz by talking as to what are they going to achieve as they meet next week in wuhan but i think laying keeping expectations low would be a good idea at this stage and also making sure that this is only a first step in in building the larger relationship where they can you know take their first step forward in becoming partners rather than becoming adversaries and in that direction i think the first step is all i expect at this stage not any breakthroughs in wuhan for me Absolutely. Okay. So, um, uh, Siddhant, you know, uh, talking about those first steps, those baby steps on a very long journey, but significant mentions made today about, uh, you know, things that have caused a great degree of pain between India and China, at least in the last year or so. And I'm referring specifically to the Kailash Yatra and the sharing of data from the Satluj and Brahmaputra. These two points, of course, have to be taken into consideration as the extension of, uh, uh, let's say, some sort of. Uh, I've used the word uh, or term olive branch already, so I'll use it again. Can we see it as that? Well, we can say like that. And the third point was that the external affairs minister also mentioned that tranquility at the borders are uh, are important prerequisite. She mentioned that. So these are the three points she mentioned. And of course, hydrological data, resumption of the Kailash Mansarovar Yatra through Nathula are two important uh, step towards uh, new reset, which is happening. But the world around China is changing. We know um, if we look at the Korean side, they're going to have that big. Korean meet and of course the meet between North Korean leader and Donald Trump uh, that is something which uh, the Chinese of course co were caught off guard and we saw the North Korean leader coming to China uh, uh, coming to Beijing in a train and then of course from the indian side also the indian side is uh, 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 reaching out to countries the indian prime minister was in sweden where all the uh, five nordic countries back india's bid for the nsg the indian prime minister is likely to visit nepal also um, uh, according to some media reports it's 11th of may when the indian prime minister visits uh, nepal uh, the nepalese foreign minister visited china and uh, from there we uh, we saw that big uh, announcement coming of uh, india china and nepal corridor so connectivity remains the buzz what it remains the key word in the the, the new geopolitical uh, if we look at the zone which is happening but uh, focus will be how both the countries come together on various friend, uh, front whether it's uh, political whether it's economic or whether it's connectivity
Okay, um, we've got a few more minutes on the broadcast to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, Ainar, I'll come to you next. You know, lots of Indian voices on the show right now. Uh, I want to hear your perspective. We've talked at length, uh, really speaking, on what India has to gain from this summit and from these developments. But for China, how important is the fact that this uh, uh, summit has been arrived at, that the fact that it's taking place as early as uh, the end of April and separate from the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit? Well, I, I think it's a, a huge statement as it says it's been in the progress in process for months. This means a lot, tremendous deal to China. There, you've I identified it. It's about trade. It's about defining the relationship of the new century between the two Asian giants in terms that they can both prosper rather than arguing about goat pastures. Uh, remember, even as we go forward, there are forces on both sides, India and China, which would love to restart some sort of trouble because they have a, a view that somehow keeping these two nations apart is better. I do believe that the new century will be defined by the relationship between China and uh, India and that that's what we should be hoping for. All right. Uh, Palki, closing comments from you on uh, the summit itself and, of course, what it signals um, in, in uh, you know, this new century and uh, the resetting that we've been talking about. Uh, Aisha, I would put it this way, that confrontation was not an option. Confrontation wouldn't have helped either side. So really, uh, the two sides did not have an option but to come together and cooperate. How they did this was a sign of maturity, I would say, from both the countries. Uh, a lot of work has gone behind the scenes from... Uh, National Security Advisor Ajit Doval's visit to Mr. Gokhale, who's who's taken over now and as is is as seasoned a China hand as you can find uh, in the Indian diplomatic circles. Uh, then we have Sushma Swaraj, who's there, Nirmala Sitaraman, who'll be going there. So both sides have very cautiously and behind the scenes, without uh, without making too much of a noise, because that tends to sometimes uh, dilute the efforts and uh, and and you start playing to the galleries. Have worked towards this, and this certainly. Uh, we, we say it, it's a beginning, but it's it's also the culmination of a lot of backroom effort that has gone into the organization of this meeting. And uh, the, the, the two leaders, I'm assuming, are going to lay the groundwork for, for further cooperation. Uh, I only want to be optimistic at this point. All right. And uh, Professor Swaran Singh, uh, definitely a number of, uh, you know, high-level meetings have taken place. Vijay Gokhale, Ajit Doval, uh, Nirmala Sita Raman, and, of course, uh, Sushma Swaraj making their way over to China. And, and from the other side, Zhong Shan has been to India. Uh, Wang Yi himself was here in December 2017. So it seems like uh, reciprocation is also, uh, let's say, the call of the day, if you will. In a matter of two months, Indian Prime Minister visiting China has never happened in history. So in on top of all these hectic visits from both sides, I think we are setting an entirely new standard of how personal diplomacy, which is also sometimes called hug diplomacy of Indian Prime Minister, is setting new standards, is, is using new tools to engage you know, major leaders, including Xi Jinping. And I think that effort has been constant to make sure that one relationship is neither built at cost of the other and neither the other side sees as hostage to India's relationship, for example, with the United States in this case. And that signal is repeatedly being given to Chinese leadership that we treat China as the most important neighbor of India. We understand a certain asymmetry in economic prowess on both sides and we are willing to partner but we cannot be partnering when, then, when, when something really hurts the national interest, for example, territorial sovereignty of India. The good news is increasingly the Chinese side is giving us a good signal that they understand this and that they are willing to engage India as their most important neighbor. And I think that sets the mood positively for, for you know, moving forward. But I repeatedly wish to underline pragmatic expectations. You know, Wuhan should not be a summit happening under too much of pressure of expectations. So baby steps is what I expect they, they should take at that stage in building a strategic relationship because they both see themselves not just in terms of bilateral responsibilities for domestic constituencies, but their responsibilities are expanding to the region and possibly to several global issues. Absolutely. So if you put, as they have repeatedly underlined the strategic element of the relationship, I think for that it is important to look at this as a first step in Wuhan. And I think it's very positive that both sides have clinched this very quick summit, which is being described informal, 
but words don't mean much when you want to really engage major powers with each other. So I think, as you mentioned, you know, cautious optimism at this stage is, is the buzzword for me. Okay, so lots of buzzwords, okay. baby steps, cautious optimism, and I'm so glad you brought up diplomacy because uh, this discussion would have uh, seemed almost incomplete without referencing that. On that note, Palki Sharma Padhyay, Aina Tangen, Sidhan Sibbal, and of course Professor Swaran Singh, thank you all for taking the time out to speak with us on that all important uh, informal summit. I'm going to stick to the official terminology. That's what it's being called. Uh, the meeting between Prime Minister Narendra Modi and President Xi Jinping, slated for late this week in the Chinese city of Wuhan. Remember, Weon's going to be tracking that meeting for you as, of course, all developments as far as the India-China relationship goes. This is your definitive destination for news related to ties between the two Asian giants. I'm Aisha Sindhu and we're wrapping up this edition of the newscast on that note. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.